Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited um, that we have a wonderful guest to talk with you this evening. And as probably many of you know, her name is Grace Cavallari. And it is my honor to welcome Grace as this year's Ammerman speaker. And I am so thrilled that Andrew Ammerman, our generous donor, is actually attending from Hawaii. So he's on with us, which is really wonderful. Um, it has been such a great pleasure getting to know Grace as we have planned her visit. Uh, Grace it, Cavallari is Maryland's 10th Poet Laureate. She is the author of 21 books and chapbooks of poetry. She has had 26 plays produced, most recently Quilting the Sun in New York in 2019. She founded, produces, and hosts The Poet and the Poem for Public Radio for 44 years on air and now from the Library of Congress. Mrs. Cavallari uh, was a poetry columnist and reviewer for the Washington Independent Review of Books for 10 years, and she has taught poetry workshops in colleges throughout the country. <laughs> Among her many honors, Grace holds the Association of Writers and Writing Programs George Garrett Award, the Penn Fiction Award, two Allen Ginsberg Poetry Awards and the Folger Library Columbia Award, the Washington Independent Review Lifetime Achievement Award and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting Silver Medal. I am so excited mm -hmm. to hear her talk writing for my life. Nurses for Community, Grace Cavallari. Thank you so much. I want to thank the Ammerman family for giving me this opportunity to work with these enlightened students this week and this wonderful faculty, Ms. Muffson, Ms. Pocelli, the technical Sarah Elwood and John helping with the technical. Thank you so much. I've been with some students today and it rocked my world. So we have a great adventure coming up for the rest of the week. I call this talk writing for my life because writers are writing for their lives. Writing is the reason we understand the world. Writing is our mainstay. Writing is our reason to go on. Writing is a way we clear chaos and get clarity from chaos. And I was wondering why it is our life force. And I believe that happiness is fleeting. We might be happy when we get a new outfit or an award or a appreciation or perhaps praise or something, a sweetheart, but nothing lasts until the next thing. However, joy is eternal and it is joy that makes us write. And because we keep wanting it, we keep writing because to get the joy, you have to keep writing. And I honestly think that's why writers keep going. That's my analysis. Now, I was in uh, the first grade this week teaching six-year-olds and I asked them uh, what poetry was. And one little girl said, it's feelings. Oh, I was so, I was over the moon. I thought that she would say, poems rhyme. I was waiting for that, you know, but she understood what they were. And now I'd like to tell you what I think poetry does. First, I think it rinses off language. If we did not have poetry, we would all sound like some awful daytime television show. Poetry actually invades and infiltrates our everyday language, and we don't even know it, but thankfully it does. Now, there is a film called The End of the Day that happens to be a, a line from Yates. And don't you know every newscaster you have ever heard 
on any news program says, at the end of the day. Well, that's Yates for you. And I was telling the little six-year-olds, what if they had to wear these same clothes every day and never wash them? Well, they thought that would be dreadful, you know. And so I said, well, that's what words are. They get old and they get dirty. Poets have to rinse them off and poets have to make them sparkle. And I believe that. If it weren't for poets, I think we'd all be talking like robots. The next thing poetry does is it, it slows us down. Now I'm Italian and I could use it. I'm pretty wired, but you can't dream in a hurry and you can't write poetry in a hurry. Poetry is a kind of dreaming. It's a kind of way of meditating, finding out what you feel, discovering yourself. And I recommend writing poetry every morning, whether you show it to anyone or not. It is a great way to get in a beautiful bubble to find who you are. Another thing poetry does, since it slows us down, we get to appreciate nature more because we take the time. Poets are noticing everything. They're noticing the light on the leaf. They're noticing the broken glass on the grass. Is it an emerald or is it broken glass? They're collecting images all day long. It's like living twice. You get to see it and then you get to say it. So noticing things is like being alive. And Buddha says, may we be awake one moment before we die. And to be a writer is to be awake all the time and to notice everything there is and to collect it. We're not the sources of everything. We're just beautiful funnels that gather stuff in all day long. What people are saying, what they look like, the red tree, the broken glass. Another thing that's very important is that poetry makes us less lonely. Now, today I saw a very good example of that in our poetry workshop. A very bright young woman wrote a poem about being 12 years old and wondering what life was about and being quite frightened about the thought of why and being in human form. And, and it was very courageous because, you know, everyone can use language, but the poet is the one with the courage. So I was quite inspired by that young person. And I made the point that she said something that all of us feel, have always felt, and perhaps do now, but we didn't say it. So the poet is someone who says something that other people just think. And then they say, oh, I thought of that, but I never, I never, I never thought anybody else did. So the deepest secret that the poet has and is expressed, then that is the most universal thing, it turns out. So that is what keeps us from being less lonely, that someone else has thought and felt what we thought, and we are not alone. Another very important thing that poetry does is preserves the beloved. We are the memory keepers, writers are the one that keep things so that they will not be forgotten. Our history's lineage, perhaps. Now, I was asked to go to Patterson, New Jersey, to go to the schools. And I have to say they were in a very impoverished area and they were very sad and deprived populations. In fact, the school I went to, the security guard didn't want to go with me, <laughs> but the students were darn, they were very, very sweet. And they were just like drooping flowers that needed poetry to hydrate them. So I talked to them about preserving the beloved and they got it, they got it. I wrote a very long poem, I won't read all of it, but it's it has some of that in it. It's called, a Poet in the Schools, Patterson, New Jersey. And I asked each of the students to go around the classroom and tell who they 
would like to preserve in a poem. Just here's a couple comments. How do we go into such a classroom? How do we make an ocean start? How will we find when they fall down what they were running from? If poets, poets would not go there, who would? We preserve the beloved. Raymond wants to preserve his father. He left us. He took care of me. He used to give me a bath. Luanda wants her baby sister where, who is no longer here. Julio wants to keep forever his stepfather who treats him like an equal, like his other son. Voices of the dream on the blackboard, the place behind it opening, opening in a tattered classroom in Patterson, New Jersey. All their bones broken one by one, put back in place, luminous fragments of a poem. Here, take this pencil. I was waiting for you before you were born. All you have is what I give you, a poem that refuses to die. All I have is what you give me, the courage to try. So even little kids can preserve the beloved because loss doesn't come just to the elderly. Now, I would like to talk about some of the elements of a poem also. And I was very much taken with Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, who talked about the balanced life. And he talked about a balanced life being thinking, feeling, sensual, and intuitive. It made a lot of sense to me. Thinking, who would not want to live an intellectual life of the mind with ideas? Feeling, what would life be out without emotions? Without seeing the bird alone on the branch or the stone alone in the desert? The feelings, like the six-year-old talked about. Sensuality, who would want to live without a peach pie or the smell of hyacinth or lilacs in, at your window or the feel of your pillow, the cotton in your pillow? The sensual life and intuition which is very difficult to teach, but not impossible. It's about knowing how much and how little to say. And that's in life as well as in poetry. How much you trust the reader, how much you trust another person to understand you without having to give them an ax in the school, in the head or shake them by the lapels. So thinking, feeling, sensuality, intuition are really dominant in a perfect poem. We don't think of it before we write, but I can see a poem and I can say, well, you know, you're very good on the thinking part, but we need to work on that sensuality. In my own case, that's the case because I get in my head so much, I forget to see the red tree. I have to stretch my eyes purposely because that is not dominant to my poetry. So I think that the young I call them four pieces of the pie, are a very, very good way to, um, to evaluate what's written with young people. And they get it and they respond to it. Now, I am shifting gears for a bit to tell you that I, anybody who knows me knows that I like to write about women in history. And I write about men too, but I'm really strong about women in history. And I've focused the last 15 years specifically on that. So I want to start with Mary Wollstonecraft. And she was the first woman to write a serious book in English in the 1800s. And when I went to graduate school in 1975, after I had my own four children safely in school during the day, I went on to get my graduate degrees. And I I was studying 18th century history and English. I came across Mary Wollstonecraft and I thought, oh my gosh, everyone knows her daughter, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, because she wrote Frankenstein, right? And she married Shelley the poet. So she's got a lot of PR, but nobody knew her mother. 
Now, this was in 75. There's been a few books since then, but there are only a couple of books about her. The woman who wrote The Vindication of Women, who started feminism, and who started the first school for girls in England, and who wrote essays and books, and I couldn't believe my eyes. So she cooked inside of me for 25 years <laughs> until I finally spent a year on her. And I wrote a book called What I Would Do for Love in Her Voice. Now, what made me think I could do this? <laughs> well, historians knew what she did, but I thought I knew what she felt because I knew what it was like to be the only woman in a boardroom and I knew what things were like. So I wrote a book in her voice and I have to just tell you a little bit about her. She was born in 1759 and she went to, to London with 12 guineas in her pockets to be a writer. Imagine she had come from a very abusive family. Now, I would not go to New York with a dollar <laughs> to be a writer, but that was what exactly what she was doing. And she wound up, luckily, um, writing column in the newspaper, the first woman. She wrote argumentative prose with Thomas Paine, William Pitt about the French Revolution, and Edmund Burke, the leading philosopher of the time, had her burned in effigy because she wanted to start education for women. Now, what's not to be interested in there? So I have to say, after I write books of poems, I always write plays about the characters because I already have the backstory. So I wrote a play called Hyena in Petticoats because Edmund Burke said she was a hyena. And in my, I have her saying, no, I'm not a hyena because hyenas run in packs and I am very much alone. So um, the play was, did pretty, was pretty interesting. It was supposed to go on at the Chesapeake Shakespeare Theater last June, but COVID stopped that. But it's, um, it's something which is very important to me, but I'm going to read three poems in her voice from her book, from my book, What I Would Do for Love, which would tell you a little bit more about her. I mean, I just had to write about her. So the first poem is called Dear Reverend Clare. Reverend Clare was a clergyman who lived down in the village and who taught her how to read and write. And that is true. However, when I wrote my play, because a play has to have more twists and turns, I have him being a little bit more interested in her than in her language and a little bit seductive. So I had to kind of twist things around. But in the book of poems, this is, this is direct and true. Dear Reverend Claire, you ask if hope gets me up in the morning. I say yes. Not in your house where everything exists, but in mine where all things are lost. The top latch takes the way to the door, and so it is true, as I teach Liza and Everina all that you teach me. You say, my child's sense of wonder is coupled with a grown person's knowing grief. And why shouldn't it be? You are talking to a girl with a pencil hidden in a broken cup on top the highest shelf, stained by curdled cream, behind a ceramic pitcher where it cannot be thrown away. She became a governess and they didn't like her. She did terribly. Lady Kingsborough, she, she was teaching the little girls they were as good as the little boys and she got canned. So um, she met Mr. Johnson who was, if it were not for Joseph Johnson, we would not know Mary Wollstonecraft today because he imagined how enlightened he was to give her a chance to write new columns in the newspaper. So this is how I imagine she talked to Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, uncommon kindness is what I call you instead of publisher. Telling me I am the first of a new genus, I tremble at the attempt. We must not on any account inform my brother or father for ridicule has always been the unfriendliest advice. The October winds blow through London, yet I hear only words exhorting my mission. I must be independent. When a writer writes, 
The words are taken by the reader, but they always belong to the writer. This body, an unwilling recipient for spirit, finally fills with a breath of confidence because of you. My luck is changing. Today I stubbed my toe and to the breaking said, thank you life. I feel something besides terror. I have a body, a mind, a heart. I invite the world to lay its head on my stomach and listen. Now she jumped into the Thames because the women hated her, the men hated her. She thought she was helping the women, but it turned out that she made their lot worse. And they, of course, at that time, mid 18th century, uh, there was a rule where men could beat their women with a stick as large as your thumb. And that's where we get the saying, um, the rule of thumb today. There's a saying, the rule of thumb. And so that was going on. And the women thought she's rocking the boat. She's making it worse. They turned against her. She thought, oh, if I don't have the women, at least I thought I had the women. She jumps into the Thames River from the London Bridge. Fortunately, her skirts billow her up and a fisherman saves her. But um, she says, even death does not want me. So I'll re read uh, just the last of this book. She's talking, she's in the village square and this is called Overheard Today. She had written the vindication of the rights of women and boy, it went over like a lead balloon. A vicious sound, famous lady with her book telling us how to act. I could not hear the rest and leaned in closer to the murmuring until she straightened and then I saw she spoke of me. Mary Wollstonecraft. She held my book vindication and shook it at her partner. My face flushed. Were it a man speaking, I would not crumble. But now I fear my dream is uninhabitable. All women are in danger unless we pick the bough from the tree ourselves. Yet a stranger was condemning me in a public place. Why not grant me the courtesy given male authors saying, it is controversial. Her fury ascends in my body. She said I made her quest for survival all the worse. Because I can read and write? Does that give me a masculine mind or just a mind? So that's my dear Mary, whom I love so much. And I was so happy to vindicate her. If writers don't do it, who will? <laughs> so um, in the play, I have everything she goes through, but she finally loves her name. And that is this tiny vindication, but it is her acceptance of her worth. Now, I do also write about contemporary women. And as I say, writers can change the narrative. And Anna Nicole Smith needed it big time. Now, nobody is going to remember her, probably Miss Muffs and maybe, maybe Miss Pocelli, but Anna Nicole Smith was a blonde model. She modeled for guest jeans and she had less networking than Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, all of the stars that have had a terrible life. You see, I think celebrity is a tragedy. And in Italian, the word for fame is fame, hunger, fame, hunger. So I saw this darling, beautiful, blonde woman being fed. She had no family, no networking, fed drugs, propped up like a buffoon and made fun of in reality TV. I, they put her in a bathtub and put clown makeup on her. And it broke my heart, really. And then I saw her on TV when she had her baby. And here she was then, these beautiful cheekbones and this beautiful face that was unruined with makeup. And I saw what she could have been if someone had just photographed her for the right reasons. So I, was, I wrote a book called Anna Nicole Blonde Glory 
no, the book is called Anna Nicole Poems. And it is actually, she is a bimbo, so it's kind of fun, but it's, it, it is on her, it's in, a, in her corner. But the play that was in New York was called Anna Nicole Blonde Glory. So you can see by the title what I was up to, right? So I um, gave her a wonderful life. I changed her ending. Instead of dying of an overdose of drugs, I gave her a nice doctor to marry. I gave her a baby. And I thought, you know, writers don't get much, but they do get a chance to change somebody's story. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And I know she was grateful as I know Mary Wollstonecraft was as well. Now, speaking of contemporary women that I like to rescue, <laughs> um, I helped to start a radio station in Washington DC so that I could get poetry on the air because I um, was teaching at Antioch College and I could get poems to 20 people in a classroom or 200 in a lecture hall. And I thought, whoa, I would love 200,000. And why, do, why is somebody else allowed to put cornflakes on the radio? Why can't I put what I think is important? So I snooped around until there was a new station going on the air. Well, the point I'm going to make here is it was an all jazz station, jazz and poetry. And it was the first black um, managed station in the country that was public radio, WPFW Washington. Well, what I'm getting to the long way around is that I met all these jazz people that came into the station in 77 and until eight, 80, I guess. And I met, you. nobody will know these, no young people know jazz. It's America's classical music, but I met Anthony Braxton and Betty Carter and then this wonderful blues singer called Big Mama Thornton. And so I'm gonna read a poem about Big Mama Thornton because when she returned to Washington years later, she was not in such good shape. So this is Big Mama Thornton. Last time I saw her, she wasn't so big. Actually, she was downright skinny, singing the final time in Washington, D.C. Backstage, she drank a quart of milk, mixed equal parts with gin, Seagram's, she told me. Then she got the idea could I contact the Seagram's people and then she could advertise for them and then they'd like her for drinking a full quart a day, their gin. I said, no, I didn't think so. And I didn't think the milk people would like the commercial so much either. She still felt bad about Elvis stealing Hound Dog the way he did, even though she was much too much of a lady to say so. Once she talked about it long ago, before she started milk with gin. I guess the drink left a sweet taste in her mouth. Now, I know that nobody in, in undergraduates know Elvis Presley was, but he was a rock and roll singer and he got millions of dollars from the song Hound Dog, which Big Mama Thornton wrote. She got not a penny from it. So, Although this is a story I tell, it's a story with a conscience. And I would like to point out that that is one of our jobs, to be the conscience in this world. I'm, I know it sounds grandiose, but every little thing we write should have a conscience, I think. And so um, I'm going to read another poem about that. This is, well, you know, people think poetry is just such a little fluffy thing. It's icing on the cake. We're just doing it instead of playing bridge, right? This is called How a Poem Begins. It's a little thing. Could be the long O's in Kosovo or a woman alone in the street after the hurricane sweeping Honduras. Perhaps we tell of the child beneath the flood in New Orleans or feet bloody from walking the rubble of Afghanistan. Such a tiny voice, no one can hear. Sometimes it says, I can't breathe. That's why we write of such little things, insignificant things. 
So that is one of the things we do. I'm going to shift back to um, the 18th century quickly because I just finished a book on another woman writer called Madame de Stael. She's a really a mess, very hard to pin down. She's not helping me at all. But she was different from Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft was a bohemian. Madame de Stael was like in the court of Marie Antoinette. So she saw things from a different point of view. But she wrote about the French Revolution. She wrote novels, plays, essays. She wrote so much political stuff that Napoleon was terrified of her. She was his nemesis. Napoleon exiled her from Paris. And she spent her whole life as trying to escape Napoleon. Now, I looked up 18th century writers in Wikipedia. No Madame de Stael, all these men. So I thought, mm, this is my, this is just my cup of tea. So I wrote this book and it was, um, it's still not easy because she's so haughty. I'm having a hard time loving her. And I always tell my students that nobody can love your work more than you do. If you send out something you hate and you think everyone will like it, no, no, no. Mm -mm. So um, I will end by reading Madame de Stael. I'm still, I think the book is done. I have to say though, when you write about history, women in history, you have to learn history. <laughs> and in Mary Wollstonecraft's case, I spent a long time with the 18th century and I found that cotton came in at the time into London and that was good for me to know what they wore. I found that the circus came to London at that time. So when I wrote my play, Punch and Judy are the narrators. So it's very important to know history to write about history. So I got really into the French Revolution with Madame de Stael and it made me crazy. The Bourbons and the Royalists and the Monarchists and the Constitutionalists, but I just went into her love life I thought that was easier. So I wrote a book in her, um, of her letters and um, of course fiction based on fact. I mean, I'm imagining what she's saying to, when Marie Antoinette gets killed. So this is one poem. She had many lovers, Talleyrand, many people you don't know in history, but one was Benjamin Constant. He was a French Swiss activist. They were all working against Napoleon. And um, he was her lover for 20 years, although she was married and he got secretly married. He still stayed with her. So here's a poem her, from her letters, 1796. Dear Benjamin Constant, for three years you have been my faithful visitor. How could I have thought anything of her other as you stood beneath my window that first night? That time I opened the door that has never closed. All others pale in loyalty and tenderness. And I, I received your contract today to always love, referring to me, the most significant person on earth. I signed my name after your name. The fact that I was the one who dictated your contract for you does not diminish its validity in the court of ecstasy. No, I signed my name after your name with a seal wet from my lips. We need no judge or magistrate to enforce the law that was already bound by our intimacies. Yet I honor the fact that you are willing to sign your life to me on paper. Now I am yours and you are legally mine. That is true. She wrote the contract and signed his name that he was bound to her forever. So you can see she's a handful. She's a piece of work. And I'm having a hard time because she's so haughty, but I'm gonna break it down yet. <laughs> so I will finish reading with a poem called, Work is My Secret Lover. Work takes the palm of my hand to kiss in the middle of the night. It holds my wrist lightly and feels the pulse. Work is who you'll find me with when you tiptoe up the stairs and hear my footsteps through the shadows. 
You'll see me lift my arm to stretch and then lean down to put my head to it. Work threatened to die once for all that was left unsaid. So I took to it like a young bride flushed with excitement. Adultery too, yes, I admit it. On all the holidays, when others gathered at the table, I was dreaming of it, making love to the movement of paper, the words from my lips, the feel of it. Sometimes when company came, I threw a tablecloth over my work and set the plates and everyone acted as if nothing were visible, pretending I was the good hostess that I was. While on the Christmas tree, work waited patiently among ornaments gleaming like a groom. I am guilty as charged, for nothing else could buy my feelings. And why would I sell the only thing that ever loved me the way I loved back, but my beautiful, long-lasting, faithful lover, my friend who will never leave. Once again, I wish to thank the Ammerman family for giving me this grand adventure this week. Thank you. I'm Grace Cavalieri. Thank you, Grace. That was wonderful. This is, I'm sure, what everybody across campus is doing right now in appreciation for what you just shared with us. Um, we would like for people to answer questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, students, if you're in the classroom, if you can just tell your teachers what questions they have. Oh, we've got one coming in already. And then Grace will, um, oh, here's one. This is actually from Andrew Ammerman. And the <gasps> question for you is, when did you first know you wanted to write? Oh, wonderful answer. The thing, I believe writers are born I believe we're born wired a certain way. I really do. I have interviewed 3,000 poets on the radio in, in 45 years. And every one of them says, you won't believe this, but I wrote as a child. I say, no, really? Because we people who are poets, I swear to you, that's the way they understood the world, even as children, was through those hieroglyphics. And I have always, I knew I was a writer in the crib, and I think most other writers do too. I mean, we don't have to be good. We don't have to be famous. We don't have to be rich. But we, if we're writers, we're writers. Thank you, Andrew Ammerman. Michelle, I am having trouble seeing some of the things in the chat. So I may need you to continue sure. asking the questions. I think maybe the issue is that they're coming in so furiously. Fast furiously, <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's a lot here. They're, they're really great too. I'm scrolling through, but I'm just gonna go right into this one because I'm sure many people are curious. What men have you written about? Oh, I have not written about men in history, but I do have written about real people. For instance, actually, I must say, it's a little solipsistic, but I, my husband died a few years ago, and we were married for 60 years. So he was an extraordinary sculptor and a naval aviator. And when he died, I wrote three books about him to keep me able. <laughs> so I wrote three books, The Man Who Got Away and two other books about trying to keep, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget anything. So I've written about the people in my life, my father, you know, the other people that I know. I cannot actually say I've written about famous men though. I think it's because I really understand women's sensibilities. I, I have to say that I, I'm limited perhaps, but in theater, I can write male uh, persons. I can write male characters. So there's something about, you give me something to think about there. There's another question. Um, what advice, and it comes from anonymous, what advice would you give to young writers? I would be thrilled to answer that question. That was why I was put on earth. I would say, first of all, declare it in the universe out loud. I am a writer. Make the commitment. Don't apologize for it. 
We didn't say you're good or bad. You're a writer. Then read a new poem every night. A poem that is of your time. Poems written in 2021. Because you're writing from your fabric and history. You're part of a scene. You have to know what's going on. You have to immerse yourself like a ball in that scene. So read a poem. You can't have more going out than is coming in. Read a poem, apprentice yourself to the poem, see how people enter the line, see the, what it sounds like, then imitate it, and then come see me. I actually think if I can interrupt for a second, that that's a perfect plug for some of the workshops that you're offering this week. And on Thursday, you're offering students opportunities to meet one-on-one -on -one with you as well, right? So that might be a great opportunity for people to come and share and come and see you. Tell me, bring a poem or else come and let me help you make a poem or tell me about your love life or tell me about your parents, but I'll be glad to see you. It's wonderful, and thank we you. We have a, a couple of those individual slots on Wednesday evening as well. I think there are two. So people should check out the Google form and sign and see all the options there and then sign up. Everybody's been sent that email recently. To, to, their, to their email. Um, here's a question from Mrs. Howe's American Studies class. Um, Grace, do you write only in English? Have you written anything in Italian? No, unfortunately, I'm one of those great um, collateral damages whose immigrant father wanted to mainstream us. <laughs> so I never really learned much Italian except good menu Italian, you know. Um, but I do have my, my books translated into Italian, and they are in Italy. And the book about Mary Wollstonecraft is, has done very well in Italy. Not very well. I mean, somebody bought one. <laughs> um, from Mr. Malone's classroom, uh, Grace, how old were you when you knew that you'd be able to make a living as a poet? Oh, you can't make a living as a poet. <laughs> oh no, I was lucky enough to have a man who supported me. He was a naval officer and I was a military wife for 30 years. And he allowed me to have this beautiful sandbox, you know, to, to play in. And he provided the roof and the food and the children and allowed me to pursue my art. The, I made a thousand dollars a year as playwright in residence at Antioch in Baltimore we set up writing programs from Antioch College. And I used to commute from Oxon Hill, Maryland, and I used that thousand dollars in gas. I mean, that was the kind of money I've been making. So then you teach your art and then you can, you know, if you teach your art. But I think that even the Pulitzer Prize winners, I bet they don't make $5,000 a year royalties in, in their books by the time their distributors get percentages. That's why every poet you know teaches. I bet every poet you've had here has been in a college or university. No, you can't make a, a money as a writer unless you're writing for popular culture. But poetry is keeping civilization from sinking in the mud. What kind of money could, I mean, who could pay for that? Grace, we have a question from someone who is anonymous. And the question is, who are your greatest poetical influences? Well, when I was young, I read, memorized all of it in St. Vincent Millay and would go all over campus reading, saying it out loud, of course. She's much underserved, actually. She's now being discovered again. I have all of her first editions because when I was young, they were editions. <laughs> they were just printed. <laughs> so I have her first edition. Louise Glick is my favorite. G-L-U-C-K. She just won the Nobel Prize for Literature Poetry. She's very modest and she doesn't give it much notice, actually. She re really would ra rather write the next poem. But I love her work. She's very to the bone. She's very spare, very minimal, and I do, uh, I do have some favorites. She's she's top. Here's a question that is from Senora Hawks 
class. Um, what techniques do you use to motivate you to start a writing project? And maybe I'll add on to that and to keep going with it. Well, I write a poem a day and I developed a, a practice when I was at Antioch as in residence of just getting 10 random words that were beautiful, just out of a book. And I gave them to my students and I found out that nobody wrote the same poem with the same 10 words. It was like fascinating. So I use a, the 10 word method for myself. I have many methods of jump starting. Mostly it starts with a feeling. And I do a lot of dream. I keep, I'm a big dreamer and I write down my dreams and I use a lot of those images because the nighttime mind is really very interesting. The nighttime mind has great images. So I use dreams. I use, I use a narrative. I like to tell stories. As your students saw today, I go into the elevator of my life and go on each floor and find a story. I might see a beautiful word and I might, I saw the word with, and it just turned me on. Now, I mean, what's wrong with me? With, I thought, what a beautiful, oh, hold that up. And that made me write a whole book. Thank you. And I didn't, I didn't design that, did I? No. So with is just think with, it's about connection. It's about relationship. So words can just touch me off and also anecdotal things I see and hear and I collect things all day and then I write stuff all day and then I just throw it on the desk and when an, a period comes and I'm writing and there's an arid moment I just go through my images and pick something up because it's all from me so they're all connected in some way it's all random and it's it it's like playing it's like playing with words. Mm -hmm. And if you don't worry about it, you never have to stop it. Listen, there was a great poet called A.R. Ammons. And I read his book in 1968 when I started sending poetry out. And he said the best thing. He said, if you're nothing, you can say and do anything. I thought, whoa, who has more credentials than I do? I'm a Navy wife with four children in the suburbs. You know, I who is more nothing than I am? And that empowered me so much that I use to this day. I think, what do I have to lose? And I tell everyone, there's really, we never know how to write every time we sit down. We're all in it together. This is another great question from Spanish Three Honors. Do you consider writing a form of escapism? In a way, a beautiful way, yes. But guess where the escape takes you? To the truest part of your reality. I always say it's all fiction, but the feelings. You can start with fantasy, but you will, if you are true to yourself, you will always wind up with a true feeling. And that, if you don't have it, try again tomorrow. Because we start with fantasy and we end up with reality. It's the heart, it's the heart. Our, it's not the brain, the heart has more cells in it. And if, you, if that is what you write about. Listen, the... Um, Poem is a context for the wound. Anytime you've been wounded and the poem comes from that, just think, it's the context. And all of us have felt everything there is to feel. And the poet just says it. And then the reader says, oh, thank God. I'm gonna combine two questions here. One is from Mrs. Brewer's class. Um, you said that Wollstonecraft and Smith would be happy about the way you change their stories. As you write, do you believe in a sense that you're writing to the subjects and that they're watching and listening? And then from uh, Mr. McGuire's ninth grade, 
English class, how were you able to get into the mind of the subjects in your books? So I'm kind of combining those two. Those are good questions, yeah. Um, first of all, I had passion to write them. And I did feel, I, I don't want you to institutionalize me, but I did feel they were with me talking in my ear. I did feel they, they were with me. I dreamed about them. I dreamed Anna Nicole put me, hugged me. I get very, I really get into the reality. And as I tell their story, I'm not telling their minds. I'm telling my mind with their, their trappings. I dress them up. I put perfume and lipstick on them. I tell them, I get them where they were in history. I say what they did, but I put what I feel in what they did because all of us know the same thing. All humankind know what it's like to be betrayed, what it's like to be loved, what it's like to be lost, what it's like to need, to want. And since we all know the same thing, then it, I just tap into that. But I dress them up in their right costumes. And it's factual. All my facts in history are really vetted, which I hate doing. I wish I had an assistant. That actually asks, that actually answers an earlier question. People, some, some people asked if you have people who help you do your work, but I guess. Oh, I really would like, I, I could just write a book a day. If I could just have somebody look up how to spell Robespierre, you know, or the little, little niggling things that you have to get right. I keep going back at the dates, you know, and I keep thinking, well, maybe nobody will know if it's 1793 or 1794, but maybe somebody will know. So I have to keep going back and back. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll get some volunteers after tonight, Grace. That would be nice. Mm. <laughs> I pay in poems. <laughs> Labors of love. Mr. Kerr's class writes, what woman whom you have written about has had the most influence on your life? I think I've had the most influence on their lives, actually. Because I keep bringing them out to shine the light on them. I honestly think that I am the puppeteer and that I'm not learning from them. I really think I'm getting them to have their say. I'm giving them their time to be noticed and I'm giving them space and heart and minds and thoughts and ideas and words. So I kind of think it's kind of top heavy. It's coming from me down, but I am influenced by every woman, po by every poet by every poem I read influences me. I learn something from every poem. I might learn how to end a stanza or punctuation or aesthetics on the page. Every poem teaches me. That's why we need to read a new one every day. This is an anonymous question. Um, and they would like to know, um, what has been your support system throughout your life or throughout your career? I have to say, um, my husband truly allowed me, you know, nowadays young women, my four daughters like slug it out in the world, you know, everybody's doing, making their own living, even in all kinds of situations. But in my husband just, we were just there for each other's art. We just supported each other's art and he could think of nothing he would rather do than buy me a car to go to Baltimore to put on a play. So he was such a huge support system. And I, I don't think I could have been a professional writer without, if I had to go and work two jobs and find daycare. So I think I was just very lucky. And um, most women I know have always had some sort of assistance or else um, you have to work three jobs to be a writer, that's all. That was the biggest support system I've ever had. I have a poem about the first uh, prize I ever won was in 1956 in Philadelphia. I won first prize for writing a poem about my mother's death. But the important thing is I had just had a baby and my husband had to drive me to Philly for the award. 
and he waited in the snow in the car all day for me to come out. I, I, that is a poem and that has been continuous because we actually, when he was a naval aviator, I mean, we, I lived alone for nine months at a time. So when it, I finally burst out into creativity, he really wanted to pay me back, I think. Grace, that's just, I just wanna say that that's a beautiful sentiment that you just shared. That's a lovely story. Um, there's, I think a great question to end on because Ms. Mufson, I think are we at, we're ending at eight, right? There's, this, is a perfect, this is a perfect question to end on. It's from um, Ms. Magalie's class. What is your advice, Grace, for staying young, lively, and energetic? Because clearly you know the answer. Me? Yes. You, <laughs> or you. <laughs> you are the most young, lively, and energetic person I think I've ever met in my life. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I just always, you know, Hemingway says, stop while the juices are high, meaning stop in the middle of a paragraph, right? So you always have something to come back to. I always have something on my desk. Also, I interview poets every week on, on radio and podcasts, and I get all that energy. It's a two-way street. I get all that currency, all that energy, all that artistic energy coming into me. And my darling students, I adore them. You know, since my husband's death, I've just ramped up my teaching. I teach every day as a volunteer as poet laureate. And I just love to turn on that Zoom and, and to, to just hydrate. And I get it back, I get it back. So it's a good way to live. I'm writing for my life. Uh, what an example you are for us. I must say, what a, what a pleasure it has been and will continue to be as you are generously going to be with us virtually for the rest of the week. Um, this is another opportunity to say, if you are inspired, if you have a question, if you have felt the slightest impulse to say, oh, that would be interesting, I might try that, listen to that voice, feel that impulse and uh, go to the Google form and fill it out and choose to take one of Grace's workshops in your uh, free rotation. And um, we do have all the, we have individual slots every half an hour, well, every half hour on the hour on Thursday and a couple on Wednesday night. And then on Friday, our workshops are really gonna be about coming together, people bringing work or to share their experience of what it's been like uh, to think about writing poetry, to write poetry, to share, and uh, any of the other ideas that Grace may have um, inculcated in your mind. It's going to be a great adventure. And um, just so you know, Ms. Pacelli will be going over the form. She'll send me a list of the students who have signed up. I will be sending you a link, an invitation to the Zoom meeting for that workshop in your rotation. Um, and so it's gonna be as easy as that. You'll get the invitation and you just have to say yes and it'll appear in your calendar and then you go. So in the either late evening or early morning of the day of the workshop, you'll get an invitation. So um, there's really no limit on how many people can go to the, to, to the workshops, the individual ones, that's really gonna be on a first come first serve basis. So, Get in there and fill out that form if you want to get to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Grace. Um, Grace, I cannot thank you enough for uh, your generosity of spirit and um, what you have shared with us this evening. And my heart goes out to the Ammerman family, to Andrew. I'm so pleased that you were able to be with us tonight. I am thrilled. And your support of this program that you have created that allows us to bring amazing people to our campus um, to inspire us 
And um, that is a great gift. So I guess I will say good evening and uh, have a great rest of your night. Arrivederci.